Welcome to Arise Observe. Hey everyone, this is the largest LLM conference of the year and we're so excited to have you here. There's over 5,000 plus attendees, 70 plus sessions, two days of all things generative. My name's Aparna, one of the founders here at Arise. I'm Jason Lopatecki, other founder of Arise. Incredibly excited and an amazing event. We have Hugging Face, we have Weights and Biases, we have Open AI, we have Labelbox and Scale and Spotify and Etsy. A part of we also have all those new LLM companies as well. We have all of the up and coming LLM startups. We got Jasper, Langchain, Llama Index, Prompt Layer, Baby AGI is speaking. This is going to be a really fun next two days. And what a year it's been. Been. I mean, it's really been, it's been the year of AI. It's an amazing year. Think about it 12 months ago when we did our last observe. Prompts weren't even in the lexicon. Dolly 2 wasn't out. Mid Journey wasn't out. Tool Former, the whole idea that LMs would use tools it were just dreams in people's heads. GTP4 didn't exist. I mean, it's just amazing what's what it's amazing the momentum in this space and it's changing our lives it's changing the lives of our our families it's it's changing the business lives as well of the people we know and open ai university of pennsylvania put out this this study around how ai and and gpt specifically might affect the jobs of people in the us and and of course, opening I would would do this, but but it, it I mean serious seriously impressive or seriously interesting results. Eighty percent, eighty percent of U.S. workers likely affected. Three hundred million people, uh, you know, mathematicians, survey writers, tax preparers, artists. I just amazing, uh, it, kind of incredibly amazing how many people this is going to affect. And what was surprising to me and Aparna though was was like the the one role one role that's very near and dear to our hearts was not on this list. And this is the the ML engineer and data scientist. And if you were if you were in a hole or or under a rock and didn't see this this Reddit post go around, it's let me tell you a little bit about it. And I think it's it's channeling what a lot of us feel. It's it's it GPT-4 and what's happening in LLMs is changing everything. And so this is a tech worker at a large tech company been, who's been working on NLP, who's been building models for a long time. And they're realizing GPT-4 is kind of making what they're doing obsolete, that the NLP models they were building are, are just kind of no longer relevant. And this is happening in a lot of areas of ML right now. And let me just dive in and give you an example of what, what, what's meant by this. Well, text classification is, is a model. It's a model that someone trains today. They build today. They, were, they collect data for, they manage it. They manage this model in production and all this work to make it work. And now it can be a prompt. It can be a, a, a text. You, you, you feed a model. You feed one of these GPT-4, a text around classification. And it's amazing what what models are being turned in really a model is becoming this task or prompt. Hey, Jason, I got a question for you. Are you saying data scientists will become prompt engineers? It's, it, I mean, it's crazy. I, you might've spent five years getting a PhD and then now you're a prompt engineer. I mean, that, that, that is the reality. I mean, I, I, I don't listen. I, I don't think it's all that case and at, at all, but but let's be honest, we're, we're all prompt engineers now. And if you're, you, you, we are all going to be doing this and this is taking over the, the space in, in, in a very, very big way. And it's not just text classification, it's all these models, these models that you've been building, niche models that you've been building for, for years and years and years are now being done by a single model and being done many times better than what you're building individually. And so for a lot of us, you, you see this momentum in this direction. 
me and a partner are talking a lot about, is it, wow, is it, is it one model to rule them all? Is it one model that, that does everything? And I, I think what, what's, what's been amazing to us is not just these individual tasks that used to be models that are getting being done, but all the other skills that are coming out of these models that we didn't think about. Now, there's this concept of emergence, which is really, I think, one of the most amazing things happening in the space, that these models, these, these LLMs are gaining skills that the, gaining skills the smaller models had, had none of. They're just showing up. The ability to debug, self-debug code, it's, it's written to create video games, auto GPT and baby AGI you know, creating these controllers. Uh, it, it's it's absolutely awe, awe-inspiring, exciting. But I, I would say at the same time, it's also got us slightly nervous. We're watching, you know, it's the, the first time in data science history where we, we just don't know all the skills the, the technology we've created has. And it might have millions. And... For me and Aparna, who've been in this space for, for a long time, we look at it and it's just there's there's never been a time where observability is more important. You need observability to watch and understand what these models are doing. And the the question you might have is as 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 these models are getting so so big and so good, is like, do do they do everything? Do they take over everything? And at one end, and I think the, the answer is no. It's it's there's a whole set of of actions today. Things models do at high scale, transaction fraud, uh, ranking that just are many, many, many orders of magnitude away from what these LLMs can produce in terms of uh, in terms of volume and, and response rates. But if you're doing lower scale NLP. If you're doing something on a lower scale, it's likely to be replaced. Hey, Jason, I got a question for you. Can, can you give me an example where today, maybe not in six months, but today that LLMs don't replace? Yeah. So, so if you're doing, say, a high scale transaction fraud, or you're doing something internet scale, say e-commerce rankings, those just are, are many orders of magnitude away. The other case I would say is, if you're doing something that requires a lot of uh, personalized information that doesn't fit in the context window, uh, a lot, lot of information that 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 is, is relevant to your business, that, that also doesn't make sense. But on the other side of this, you've got say say these lower volume um, these lower volume skills or lower volume um, uh, applications like B, like the B two B copilot stuff, which never could have been done before, which are whole almost whole new companies. So you have Copilot, uh, Copilot for code, Copilot for lawyers like Harvey. You have Copilot for medicine. You have all these new skills to apply in in ways that we've never thought of before. And you know, we've surveyed fifty six percent, fifty six percent of the customers that we surveyed. These are enterprise and mid market companies are planning to put GPT four into production in the next twelve months. So these this will be widespread use. And, and what I'd love is a partner, maybe you can talk to us a little bit about what LLMs look like in production. Yeah. So what do LLMs look like in production today? Well, an application calls out to OpenAI, Anthropic, it gets back responses, and then it puts those responses in their application. It actually works pretty great when the responses are good, but LLMs can go wrong. LLMs can hallucinate. They can make up answers. We actually ran a massive survey where we asked hundreds of data scientists, what are you worried about with putting LLMs into production? Over 45% of them said that LLMs hallucinating, giving inaccurate responses was one of the biggest reasons why they were nervous about putting them into production. Observability will be needed in the LLM world. And there's a whole new stack 
of technologies that are growing behind putting LLMs into production. It's called LLM Ops. And this new stack contains prompts, agents, fine tuning, evaluations, uh, agents. All of these will require some components of observability. And today we're launching LLM observability across the Arise platform. Let me tell you what that looks like. So first off, prompts and responses are logged to the Arise platform. Uh, these prompt and responses can be uh, one-off, they can span multiple conversations, they can be many tasks within an agent. The key thing here, though, is that it's not just the text. It's not just the prompt and the response, it's the embeddings. And Arise can generate the embeddings, or we can take in user embeddings, but these embeddings are going to be core to observability in the LLM space. So prompt and responses are logged to the platform. What next? Well, troubleshooting really works when you can find groups or patterns of issues and, and really kind of pinpoint uh, where the problems are. And Arise finds these clusters of bad responses. Um, that could mean frustrated customers. It could mean uh, language problems. But it finds these clusters where the responses were just not great. What's like a, a very specific example that you've seen go, go wrong and how people fixed it? Yep. I, you know, we've seen language actually been a pretty big issue. Um, this is where the prompt might be in one language, the response might be in a different language. And if the response, you know, the language that the user wanted in the response wasn't indicated in the prompt template or, or kind of called out, we've noticed that the response can just be off. So that's one where iterating and getting the prompt template to call it out is, is kind of a way to, to fix that. But even knowing that's a problem is really hard to find. So being able to group together these, these common patterns and issues is important. And you also want to sort kind of which uh, clusters are really having the worst responses by some type of evaluation scores. Um, and you might be asking, well, what does evaluation even look like for LLMs? You can't just throw your typical accuracy type of metrics um, at it. So, you know, there's there's a whole spectrum. On one end of the spectrum, which we'll get into, it, it can be really complex. You use AI to evaluate AI. It's called LLM assisted evaluation. There's a simple middle ground called, you know, where users can just, where you can get user provided feedback. So this might be a thumbs up, a thumbs down. How was my response? that I gave, did the user accept it and put it in their application or did they reject it? There's also on the other end, a little bit more of these task-based metrics. So if you're doing summarization tasks or translation tasks, you can pull from kind of the library of NL, you know, metrics that were commonly used in the NLP space and pull them in to, to use here. So, so what, what do you see the most in our customer base of, of these today? Yeah, the thing that, is in the most common right now is that user provided feedback. Super simple. You can put it in your application. You can ask good response, bad response. I'm sure many of you have done this on chat GBT as well. Um, the problem and the con is users might not always give you that feedback. And any data scientist who depends on just user provided feedback pr probably complains to you that you could get a really small sample set. So the thing I'm really bullish on, the one I'm really bullish on is the LLM assisted evaluation. So let me deep dive into what that looks like. So what is LLM assisted evaluation? The meta point here is it's really AI evaluating AI. And the reasoning is some tasks are just so complex, it requires equal intelligence to be able to evaluate them. For example, you're in college, you write a paper, you might have a professor, an actual human grades your paper. Similar concept here where as the tasks get more complex, AI is going to grade AI. And the way it looks like in our world is you log these prompt responses to arise. As they're logged, there's different prompt templates that you can use to generate the score. So you can just ask, here's the question, here's the answer, rate the answer, and that score gets logged. That score comes from an LLM, it gets logged to the platform. And now you have scores for all of your responses that you can use when you're 
trying to understand what clusters really, really have horrible responses. So zooming back out, we now know where the problems are. We know which clusters to go focus on. That's the set that has the worst scores. What do you actually do to fix these, the responses? And at a really simple level, you can either ask better questions or you can get better or you, you can train the answer to be better. In the world of asking better questions, you can ask the questions with all the context. You can prompt engineer so that the templates have a lot of context to give you better answers. Or if you want your answers to be very hyper-personal, you need to fine tune it on your own data, you, you can use, you can kind of fine tune the LLM to give you better responses despite the type of maybe prompts that, that are sent in. And let's, let's kind of dive into each one of them. So in the world of prompt engineering, well, what does that look like? You have various templates, you get feedback. You're trying to understand which templates are better, which templates uh, are, are giving you the better responses and have, let's say, higher approval rates in this example. Um, and the, the hard part is how do you go improve those templates? You can go fix the user input, add more to the instructions, add more to the context, but it's really about building better prompt templates to get better responses. Prompt engineering might only get you so far though. If you need to really build on your own data, you need to hyper-personalize it, you might need to fine tune. What does that look like? Well, you find these clusters of problems again, so it could be your language cluster. You go find as many examples as possible, and then you go fix the responses, what, what the ideal response would have been, and fine tune the LLM to give you those better ideal responses. And I, I feel like there's so much going on in LLM ops here. I've also been hearing about agents. I was wondering if you can, uh, these, these autom automatic AGI agents, what, what, what are they and, and what do they do? E there's no generative deck that can happen right now without talking about agents. So let's get into it. So agents really are about, I think about it as autonomous AI. You, it, it figures out how to do tasks for you based on some type of overall bigger goal. So if you have a complex goal, like go to the grocery store, figure out what ingredients are needed for carrot cake and go buy it for me, it can break down the complex tasks into these smaller components, figure out how to order them, and then go execute them. And every single layer of these tasks is going to need some type of observability. There's two great talks about agents at Observe that we have. There's Harrison Chase from Lane Chain giving a talk. Baby AGI is giving a talk. And so we'll be going a lot deeper here in those sessions. Definitely check them out. The big picture is agents have a lot of autonomy. If there's anywhere observability is going to matter, it's going to be agents. And they're massively growing in popularity. AutoGPT has over 100k plus stars on GitHub already. I mean, it's 100,000 GitHub stars in like four weeks. I, I'm a little suspicious there isn't a baby AGI set up to the goal of getting AutoGPT's GitHub star. I mean, in, in, incredibly insane. I, one other thing I would add on this is, that's mind-blowing to me is if you look at, say, a baby AGI code base, 300, line, 300 lines of code, 250 of them are, are probably prompts which is a little bit of a, a note on the future. Uh, pretty, pretty amazing. Well, thank you for, for going through all the LLM ops and everything going on in the space. Now let's hop in and give you what we've built. Observability needs to go across everything. It needs to go across your LLMs. It needs to grow across all your model types. That same software you need to find problems, catch issues in production, know in the data, get to the data problems that are causing that, and then iterate. You need one platform for that. Today we're launching Observability for LLMs. If you wanna try it out, head over to the Arise docs. You'll see a new model type, LLMs, and there you can check out the tutorials to get started. Let's jump into a demo. In this example, I have a customer support chatbot where users can ask questions and the chatbot will give back answers. 
we're logging the inputs that the users kind of asked, the questions that they asked as prompts, and then the response that the chatbot gave as their response. What we want and the metrics that we're really measuring is thumbs up or thumbs down. We want users to give us thumbs up, the response was great, and we're really trying to avoid thumbs down. However, it does look like there's a period where we're seeing a lot more thumbs downs from our users. Let's go figure out what we're doing wrong. So I jump in and I'm taking a look at the response embeddings. I'm gonna go ahead and click on the time period that we saw a spike in that thumbs down rate. And what it's doing behind the scenes, it's generating the UMAP, it's clustering all of these prompt and responses. And what we're really trying to do is group together these prompt and responses to find problems. I can see a cluster here, and all of these are kind of different clusters of these prompt and responses. And um, these clusters all, you know, as you can see, they kind of show up on different spots of the UMAP as well. This cluster over here is one where it does look like uh, users are asking questions like, uh, I'm so frustrated, I can't even, you know, I can't even, the UI is overly complicated, I've tried to contact customer support. So this cluster looks like it's one where users are really frustrated. This one looks like users are typing in math questions into the chatbot. Um, I have a cluster where users are typing in questions in Spanish. So the, these are really kind of groups of prompts and responses that are similar. And what we're trying to do is find where find a group where there's problems. And it really looked like the first one had that. L let's dive in. So there's a couple here where it says the new AI feature is driving me crazy. The onboarding process was complicated. I've tried contacting customer support. So users are really frustrated in their prompts. And in the response, it's, it's very clear the model is also not that helpful. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, I'm not equipped to help. Uh, I understand your frustration. Have you tried reaching out? So these, these aren't also the best responses. So what I can do from here, now that I've found a group of, of, of problems, I, I, I kind of have, I have kind of options to now go and fix it. I can download this cluster of problematic responses and I can decide, well, should I go back and change the prompt template and the prompts so that I'm giving better responses? I can also decide to go fine tune my LLM on these type of prompts and, and give it better responses that I would expect my chatbot to, to give. These are both workflows and troubleshooting workflows that you can kick off from the Arise platform. And really what, what this platform now enables is for users to find groups of problematic responses and give you workflows and tools to be able to fix them. I'm excited to let you all try it out and, and share kind of things that you find in your model. We're super excited to launch this and we hope you give it a try. Well, that was amazing. Well, there's one more thing. Observability needs to go from notebook to platform. You need observability in your notebook and platform to work together. So we are announcing today open source ML observability for your notebook. Embeddings are at the core of what we built. They're at the core of every new model, large language models, latent structures, the core of it. And troubleshooting workflows that start with embeddings that help you understand what these models' decisions are, where their problems are, where their manifolds and concepts and problems in, inside them are, help you get down to that issue. Even ask GPT-4 what it thinks the solution is and what the problem is, and the ability to compare these A-B clusters as well. We're incredibly excited. Not only does it work on, on, ta on, on image and, and text, but it also works on tabular data. Excited to give you a demo of Phoenix. Phoenix is an open source ML observability library. It's designed for the notebook. Data scientists, ML engineers can ingest their model inference data into Phoenix for LLMs, CV, NLP, even tabular data sets. And 
really quickly figure out problems or insights about their models. They can then use this to export the issues, fine tune the model, improve the model based off of the issues that they found. Today, I'm gonna to walk you through two examples, one with computer vision and one with a generative LLM model. If you wanna follow along or try it out yourself, there's a number of awesome tutorials in the Phoenix docs that you can check out today. Let's jump in to the computer vision one. So in this example, I've already ran the tutorial. The model is predicting user actions. So in this example, it's predicted users drinking a beverage. They really are drinking a beverage. And we're gonna go ahead and visualize this data in Phoenix itself. You can launch it in a notebook or you can launch it in a browser. I've just launched it into the browser. I can see the model schema. It has the image embedding. It has the other dimensions as well, the predicted class and then the actual class. Let's jump in and take a look at the embeddings. I'm looking, the first thing that, that Phoenix shows, shows up is the embedding drift. This really is comparing the embeddings from a primary data set against the embeddings in a reference data set. And what that really means is that it's comparing has the underlying data or the images moved or changed between these two data sets. I can click on any one of the time periods on this drift graph and it generates a new point cloud visualization for me. This is UMAP, but to make it clear, Phoenix isn't just a UMAP visualization tool. Phoenix is the first platform to visualize the embeddings, provide clusters, and really give you a tool to troubleshoot clusters in a single platform. And the reason you need this is that models learn surfaces or manifolds about, they, they really learn by, by understanding the surfaces and manifolds of your data. And in order to be able to troubleshoot the models itself, we need to be able to understand these surfaces ourselves. And so we automatically cluster all of the, the kind of data that's seen in, in the data set. And I could see it really tries to find groups or concepts that, that are similar. I can see a cluster here that's really grainy, a cluster here that's really blurry, uh, some examples of biking, eating, um, running, and, and really, it's, it's kind of the way that the model thinks of these similar concepts within the data. And what I can do, if I scroll back up, what we saw was there was really these clusters where the model only saw this type of data in my primary data set, didn't really see it in my reference data set. And so there's automatically kind of workflows to export it, send it back to my team so they can use it to retrain the model with more types of data. Let me jump in to an example with LLMs. In this example, we're looking at not images, but text data. It's the prompt and responses being sent from an application. We went ahead, logged this data over to Phoenix, and let's go ahead and launch Phoenix for this model. Here, I have the prompt response vectors, and I also have additional dimensions like prompt links, the prompt category, conversation ID, uh, API call duration, so there's a lot that you can add to, to really visualize and slice your data. Let's jump in and take a look at the response vector here. In this case, I'm gonna jump through a couple different clusters and I can see there's, there's kind of a cluster where it looks like the model's really annoyed. I can even, if I want, colorize all of this by a prompt category so that I can kind of better see the different groups. There's a group here where it looks like the model's annoyed, a lot of Spanish responses, so maybe it's not doing well with this language. A cluster of, call it chemistry concepts, cluster of travel-related concepts. As a user, you know, as the person behind an application, I really want to go dig into this and understand, well, looks like there's several users that are annoyed. I want to go export this data set and try to understand, well, what did my users find annoying? What were they frustrated about? I can export that data set, load it back in directly into my notebook. And then I can even just ask, uh, even just ask ChatGPT to go ahead and summarize the data that we just found in that cluster and, and ask it to explain what the data represents. It says the cluster represents a set of phrases in Spanish, common everyday interactions. The cluster also includes a pattern of frustration or annoyance expressed in both English and Spanish. Uh, this is really great because now I know 
what the cluster means. I can use this data to make my prompt, you know, take that into consideration when I'm generating the response and give a better experience to my users. There's this and more in Phoenix. Try it out today. There's a lot that you'll discover with your own models. Well, that kicks off Arise Observe. If you have any questions for Aparna, myself, or any of the panelists, please drop them in the community. We're going to answer them as they, they come in, either during the session or after the session. Please try Phoenix. It's the future of ML observability. It's ML observability in a notebook. We're going to be growing it massively from its base of a product right now. If you love it or like it, please start. It's how our team gets feedback. Uh, it's our how our team gets appreciation for what they've done. Uh, and if you enjoy uh, the videos or you miss a session, they're going to be available during and the conference in the conference software. After the conference, they'll be available on YouTube. OpenAI is next. Enjoy the event.